Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today I'm going to show you one of the tools I use when teaching motor controls. The goal is to make an inexpensive motor controls trainer board and motor mount that can be utilized for a number of different projects. These training tools are reusable, flexible, expandable, and comparatively expendable. Ordinarily, motor control devices are semi-permanently mounted in a rugged locking metal enclosure. While structurally superior to the environment I'll build today, these enclosures don't necessarily facilitate learning and guided troubleshooting experiences because of the cramped and dimly lit interiors. The Motor Controls Trainer Board is an open, portable, and reusable environment and can be used to illustrate the act of assembling and troubleshooting a number of functional circuits. Before we begin, let me remind you, I am not an electrician and you cannot use anything in this or any other lecture as professional electrical advice. Follow the rules. Follow the code. It's there for a reason. To protect people and property from hazards arising from the use of electricity. Some of the material and techniques you may see in this lecture may not be utilized for a permanent approved installation, but is for demonstration purposes only. This content has been developed for edification only. While reasonable care has been exercised with respect to its accuracy, I assume no responsibility for errors, omissions, or suitability for any application or misapplication of its contents. Let us begin. The motor controls trainer board necessitates either a piece of plywood or a metal plate to serve as the base. In this case, I'm using a scavenged 21 inch by 21 inch metal plate. If scavenged metal plates aren't an option, plywood is cheap and easy to work with since you don't have to pre-drill mounting holes, but significantly less durable. If there is one thing I've learned throughout my career as an officer, engineer, and instructor, is to never underestimate the capacity of soldiers, operators, and students to break things. Plywood is cheaper, lighter, and expendable. However, it's almost too expendable. Expect it to last a quarter, or maybe even a half a quarter if you deal with especially rough-headed dunderpates like I do on a daily basis. In addition to being significantly more rugged, the metal plate also has an angled lip that serves to secure it to a lab workstation, enhancing the ergonomics and accessibility of the finished product. Additionally, the motor controls trainer board necessitates four lengths of one inch wide cable tray, two 12 inch long DIN rails, two push button enclosures, and mounting hardware. Finally, you need to make a choice up front about which level of pilot voltage you'll be using for your motor controls projects either 120 volts AC provided by a control transformer or 24 volt DC provided by a power supply. In this case, we're gonna go with a 120 volt AC control transformer directly mounted to the metal plate. First, pop out the knockouts in the top and bottom of each push button enclosure and set them aside for now. Next, mount an 18 inch long piece of cable tray on the left bottom edge of the metal plate and three 20 inch pieces go on the top middle, and bottom butted up against the cable tray on the left. Resist the temptation to clip any of the cable tray fingers just yet. The two 12 inch long pieces of DIN rail go centered between the top and middle and the middle and bottom cable trays butted up against the left side cable tray. The DIN rails will be used to mount various devices. They're especially handy because the devices can be quickly added and removed as needed and there's more than enough real estate to expand. Note the two empty spaces at the top and the bottom on the right hand side. These spaces are reserved for items that don't mount to DIN rails, but rather devices like the control transformer, motor drives, and the push button enclosures that are mounted directly to the board with fasteners. If everything you plan on making use of is DIN rail mounted, by all means, use longer lengths of DIN rails. Next, mount the control transformer to the right of the top DIN rail. We'll wire up the control transformer test it, and make use of it in later lectures. Keep the associated data sheet, wiring diagram, voltage links, fuse holders, and finger safe covers in a safe place until then. Finally, mount the push button enclosures on the far right side. We'll fill these enclosures with input and indicator devices in later lectures. Now we have to make a plug and a cord. Our particular lab has access to light industrial three phase 60 Hertz AC with a 120 volt line to neutral and 208 volt line to line with a neutral and ground connection. This will necessitate a length of five conductor cable, an appropriate plug head, a plug lockout and tagout device, a lock, key, and tag, 
and all the tools you'll need to assemble the plug, including wire cutters, wire strippers, a screwdriver, and a utility knife. First, cut the cable to length. Our lab is blessed to have an accessible numerous drop connections to three-phase AC. Five feet of cable should do the job. Next, take apart the plug head and slide on the dust cover. Don't be the person that tries to do this after the fact. Next, remove a portion of the exterior insulation, taking care not to damage the wires inside. Make sure you are the one that is handling the utility knife during this portion of the exercise, not your lazy lab partner. Matter of fact, don't let your lab partner touch anything, ever. Put them in a round room and tell them to go pee in a corner. That should keep them busy for a little while. Next, strip a portion of the individual wire insulation. Remove the packing between the wires, taking care not to damage the wires. Match the plug head connections with a manufacturer recommended placement. This particular configuration necessitates the green ground wire be affixed to the green center hole. Tighten it to the manufacturer recommended torque specification. Similarly, this configuration necessitates the white neutral wire be affixed to the silver tab. The phase wires L1, L2, and L3 are then routed as desired and tightened to the manufacturer recommended torque specification. Note applied phase sequence dictates the direction of rotation of an industrial three-phase AC motor. Make sure all plugs are wired consistently if you're working with a group so that way there are no surprises. Next, slide the dust cap on and tighten the plug head. Now, before you do anything, run and grab your lockout and tagout device, stick the plug in it, lock it up, and keep the key. Make sure your lab partner does the same. This ensures some dummy doesn't plug it in while you're working on it. The other end of the cord also needs to have the exterior cover and insulation removed from the individual wires. Now you need to make a choice. Either you can permanently mount the cord to the board or make it removable. My choice is a removable cord for two reasons. First, a permanently affixed cord is awkward and makes handling and storage an issue. Second, headstrong students aren't tempted to carry the motor controls trainer board using the cord. Like I insinuated earlier, I can give my students a rubber hammer and an anvil, come back in 30 minutes to find they've broken both of them. Let's install an additional short length of DIN rail in the upper left corner of the motor controls trainer board. This extra length of DIN rail will be used to mount the removable cord using terminal blocks. A brief aside on terminal blocks. Terminal blocks are handy devices that make the act of routing wires easier and more accessible. Numerous varieties of terminal blocks exist, including single and multi-level. A terminal block is basically an accessible point of connection. You don't have to use them, but they sure help. Examining a terminal block from the side we can see that there exists a conductive connection from one end to another. Terminal blocks are designed to be sandwiched together. An end cover and brackets on either side locks to the DIN rail and holds the assembly together. An ohmmeter indicates connection across an individual terminal block. However, an ohmmeter indicates there is no connection to the neighboring terminal block. Despite their close proximity, each terminal block is to be considered an isolated entity insulated from each other and the DIN rail. Note special fittings like jumpers can link side-by-side -side terminal blocks together, making it possible to pool connections without a lot of messy wires. An ohmmeter indicates connection to the neighboring terminal block, making use of a jumper. Additionally, special purpose terminal blocks, like this grounding terminal block, not only serve to mechanically connect wires, but also serve to electrically connect conductive DIN rails and enclosures to ground thereby ensuring conductive parts are touch safe and circuit protection devices function as intended. An ohmmeter indicates connection between the grounding terminal block and the DIN rail. Permanent installations would go to the trouble of numbering, documenting, and labeling all the terminal blocks. In addition to simplifying wider routing, the terminal blocks make it easy to take voltage readings and make continuity checks without digging through a nest of wires. We can attach an assembly of five independent terminal blocks to the small DIN rail and then attach the free end of the locked out plug. These five terminal blocks will serve to respectively distribute the phases L1, L2, and L3 and the neutral and ground connection to the rest of the board. Despite the cord being intentionally removable, I recommend you add a removable strain relief to secure the cord during use. When the plug is plugged in, this group of terminal blocks would 
always be hot. Remember this. Anytime you are working on this system, you need to make sure all sources of hazardous energy are released and none can build up during the course of your service. That's really the purpose of the locking plug cover. When you're wiring something up, unplug it and keep the plug covered and locked. Only when you are done and the work meets inspection are you authorized to plug it in. In this case, we've accomplished our desired task and we're now authorized to put this bare trainer board to the test. When the cover is unlocked, removed, and the plug inserted, a DMM in AC voltmeter mode shows that the first group of terminal blocks does in fact route power to our board. The line-to-line -line voltage is observed to be close to 208 volts, and the line-to-neutral voltage is observed to be approximately 120 volts. Alternatively, if you have available a dedicated secure storage area for the motor control trainer boards, you may wish to consider permanently installing the plug to the board. This necessitates a slight reconfiguration of the wire duct in that the top length is upsized to a 3 inch by 3 inch, allowing for increased space due to the presence of the larger primary wire. Ultimately, this wire will be routed directly to a circuit breaker without the use of the terminal block intermediaries. First, trim a set of the wire duct fingers directly above where the circuit breaker will mount on the upper left, and then secure it to the board with a wire clamp. For obvious reasons, you cannot plug the board in in its current state. We'll examine, test, and install a circuit breaker in an upcoming applications exercise. Although unimpressive now, later applications exercises making use of the motor controls trainer board will start from this base state. Like I said, there's plenty of room to expand, and we've got plenty of toys to play with. While we're on the subject of base states, let's bring one of our other toys up to speed. Motor control circuits obviously necessitate a motor. We're going to use a quarter horsepower, dual voltage, nine lead Y configured motor for later applications exercises. This motor will always be used in the low voltage configuration. However, we still might need to disconnect it from our motor control circuit for transport or troubleshooting scenarios. So we'll mount the motor to another board as well as another set of terminal blocks affixed to a short length of DIN rail. The motor can now be placed in the low voltage configuration using the relatively secure terminal blocks instead of some chintzy wire nuts. Leads 1 and 7 are tied together using terminal block 1 on the far left hand side. Leads 2 and 8 are tied together using terminal block 2. Leads 3 and 9 are tied together using terminal block 3. Finally, leads 4, 5, and 6 are tied together using terminal block 4 on the far right hand side, forming the central node of a Y. Three phase AC from our motor controls trainer board would be applied to terminals 1, 2, and 3. There you have it, two base tools with which we will employ in later applications exercises. One, a bare motor controls trainer board with plenty of room for expansion, and two, a motor just waiting to be controlled. Note, make sure the mounting method befits the size of the motor you use. The plywood board will hold this pipsqueak down, but don't be surprised if a larger motor mounted to the same board acts like a crocodile death rolling a zebra. Don't blame me if you get bit. Total cost for this setup was pretty minimal. I'll try to include part numbers in the information section associated with this video. The most expensive component is the motor. A quarter horsepower three phase AC squirrel cage induction motor might run you about $200 ish. You might be able to scavenge something cheaper or freer if you know what I mean. Note, if you're working in a group setting and your school or organization is on a super tight budget, realize that not every lab group requires their own personal motor. You could conceivably get by with a limited number of motors serving as a final checkpoint for the whole lab. Right now, the motor controls trainer board and motor don't do anything. However, they serve as the base states from which we will build many projects. Next up, circuit protection and a brief look at some of the components we'll be using in later projects, including switches, indicators, relays, motor starters, contactors, overloads, timers, and more. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.